Bibles with me to the prophecy of Jeremiah at chapter 18. Jeremiah at chapter number 18. Verses 1 through verse number 6. And I want to talk to us this morning from this thought, lessons from the potter's house. Lessons from the potter's house. Not the one in Dallas, but the one in the scripture. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause thee to hear my words. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Then I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought a work on the wheels, and the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again another vessel as seemed good to the potter to make it. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, O house of Israel, cannot I do with you as this potter, said the Lord? Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in my hand, O house of Israel. Thank you. You may be seated. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. God uses many images in the scripture to describe his relationship to his people. Come on, sir. Come on, sir. He uses the image of the shepherd and the sheep. Yeah. He uses an image of a husband and a wife, yeah. of a father and his children. Yeah. As our shepherd and we his sheep, he protects us. He provides for us. In the imagery of the husband and the wife, he loves us without condition. Just this husband and wife analogy, as, as the husband loves his wife and gives himself up for her, that's how Christ loves the church. That's how God loves his people so that he sent his son Jesus to give up his life to love us without condition. In the father-children analogy, we are always under the father's constant, watchful, loving care. As a father pitieth his children, so does God pity us. He's always on our side. He's always watching over us. We are never out of his protecting presence. He's like a shepherd. He's like a husband. He's like a father. But perhaps one of the greatest portraits of God and his people to be found in the entire Bible is the picture Jeremiah paints of the potter and the clay. I want us to look first of all at the potter's intentions. The potter in Jeremiah has a singular purpose. He plans to take clay and produce profitable vessels. Uh, that, that's his plan. To take 
clay, ordinary, unusable, worthless clay. But in his hands, turn it into a vessel that's profitable. That's his plan. That's his intention. Jeremiah says, I know the plans that I have for you. Plans to prosper you. Plans to give you a future and a hope. He, he purposes. He plans. He intends to take worthless clay and turn it into profitable vessels. Jesus saves the sinner by his grace. And then he begins the process of changing that vile sinner into a vessel that will be profitable for the kingdom of God. Useful in God's work and brings honor and glory to God's name. But the clay does not always cooperate. The potter intends to make it a useful vessel, but the clay is not always malleable. It's not always pliable. It's not always useful. So the potter has to send the clay through a process. He intends to make it a useful vessel. But in the potter's hand, the clay is not always cooperating. It's his intention to make it a profitable vessel. But with all of his intentions, he's got to work with the ingredients. Brothers and sisters, uh, let me see if I can help us to see something this morning. It takes a long time to make a strong Christian. It takes a long time to make a strong preacher. It takes a long time to make a strong church worker. It takes a long time to make a strong believer. What happens a lot of times at the church is we take people off the potter's wheel too soon. We put a novice in a place of spiritual authority and they have not suffered enough. They've not had enough trials. They've not had enough sickness. They've not had enough disappointment. And when God can't take you through everything you need to go through in order to be useful, you will be clever enough to get where you don't belong. Oh, I wish I had a witness here. It's not by your cleverness. It's not by your ability. It's not by your academic excellence. But it's about spending time on the potter's wheel. Uh, let me see if I can help us. We know what the potter's intentions are. But let's take a look secondly at the potter's ingredients. In order to accomplish the lofty goal of turning a vile vessel into a useful instrument, the potter must work with materials that leave much to be desired. I say often that it is surprising what the Lord gets done with who he has to do it with. I wish I had a witness here. It's surprising what the Lord accomplishes at Lily Grove with the raw materials that he has to work with. Starting with Reverend Anderson. 
See how quiet you got right there? Because you think that because you've been around here a while, you're worth something. But God takes worthless materials, forms and shapes it into a vessel useful for his service, but you got to go through the process. You got to spend some time on the potter's wheel. Clay, as it is found in the ground, is not suitable for the potter's use. It is brought out and allowed to weather for weeks. And then after the weeks of weathering, the dry material is then dumped into a trough and covered with seawater. When the lumps are softened, they are stirred until all of them have disintegrated and a slimy, muddy substance called slip has been formed. The slip is then drawn off and settles into a tank where all the stones and lumps are then removed. When the clay has been given time to settle, the material is worked by treading it with feet. And after it has been treaded underfoot and allowed to sit another six months, then the plasticity and the pliability of the clay is given time to improve. It takes a long time to get the clay out of the ground, get all of the lumps out of it, settle it in a trough, cover it with seawater, make a substance called slip, and then tread it under your feet, take it out and let it settle for another six months to get everything ready to finally turn it into a vessel that it could not have become without processing before getting on the wheel. Before God can get you on the wheel, he got to get the lumps out. He's got to tread you under his feet. You got to cry. You got to suffer. You got to sit a while. You got to take some stuff that you thought you would never be able to take. You got to stand up under some stuff that you thought you'd never be able to stand up under. Then after that process, he puts you on a wheel for another process. Yeah. We know the potter's intention. I've talked to you about the potter's ingredients. And now I want to deal with the potter's instruments. There's a shovel where he digs the clay from out of the earth. The clay is mixed with mud. And only the skilled potter knows the difference between mud and clay. Somebody ought to help me preach it. Only an experienced potter knows how to differentiate between mud and clay. Because in the process of making the clay pliable, when the sun comes out, the potter knows that if it's mud, it'll stiffen up. But if it's clay, it'll soften up. The sun, S-U-N, will stiffen one and soften the other. I wish I had somebody to help me again. The Holy Spirit is the shovel 
that the potter uses to dig up the clay. And everybody in here this morning is made of one or two substances. You are either mud or clay. So that when the sun, S-O-N, shines in this worship, it will stiffen one and soften the other. I wish I had a witness here. I'm glad when the Holy Ghost speaks to me, I don't harden my heart. I know I've been wrong. I know I've sinned and come short of his glory. I know I am not worth anything. So I've got to let the Holy Ghost soften me. Oh, you, you should have been here Tuesday night when Reverend Washington was preaching to us about Isaiah's conversion. He made mention of something that's been burning on my heart ever since I heard it Tuesday night. That when the Holy Ghost comes into the life of a believer, it makes you cry. Uh, honey, be careful marrying a man who can't cry. Because if he doesn't know how to cry, he'll make you cry. No, the Holy Ghost will soften you. Have I got a witness? And when you sin, the Holy Ghost will make you remorseful. He'll make you regret that sin. You don't brag about sin. You try to cover it up. And then when you cover it up, you can't prosper. But if you confess it, the Lord will have mercy. And when you come to worship, you cry because you know you don't deserve to be here. Listen. That's, that's, the, that's the problem that I have with the sin of same-sex marriage. Those of us who know we are sinners, we are not trying to expose that. Somebody missed that. Something's wrong when you want to bring sin out of the closet. When I sin, I want to keep that covered up. Because I'm ashamed of that. Have I got a witness? I'm embarrassed by that. Because I call myself Christian, and when I sin, I'm not trying to come out in the light. I'm trying to go in the dark. Oh, but the Bible says if we confess, Have I got a witness here? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, but he's got to shovel out the mud from the clay. Only the Holy Ghost can do that. Don't trust no people in your Sunday school class to do that. Don't trust no people in your prayer circle to do that. Because they might get rid of some clay trying to get rid of some mud. Have I got a witness here? Uh, you remember Jesus? Jesus told a story about the wheat and the tares. He said, while men slept, an enemy has come in and sown some tares among the wheat and the worker said Lord should we go in there and, and bundle up the tares and get them out of the wheat Jesus said no leave it alone you ain't smart enough to do that leave it alone you are not precise enough to do that leave it alone you are not discerning enough to do that let the wheat and the tares grow together and when I come I will do the separate. There's some mud and clay in here right now. 
somebody's getting stiff while somebody's softening up. But don't you try to figure out who it is because you don't know if you mud or clay. And then, not only does he use a shovel, but he has a mallet. After the clay has been cleansed and processed, it is placed on the table and beaten, watch this, to remove air bubbles. Because if the air bubbles are not removed, when he gets it on the wheel and fashions it into a vessel, there will be some weak spots. And God wants to put you on the table to... That's when you're crying. You got to go to the doctor. Your children break your heart. Folk lie on you. People criticizing you. The Lord is just getting the air bubbles out so that when he gets ready to use you, there won't be any weak spot. Lord, if you got to beat me to bless me, if you got to hurt me to heal me, if you got to knock me down to pick me up, I am thine, O oh Lord. Listen, don't be quick to ask God to use you because you're going to have to go through something. You look good today. You got a raise on your job. God's got to get those air bubbles out. Because when you get full of pride, when the opportunity for use comes, you'll think you're doing it instead of God. Paul says, therefore, would I rather glory in my infirmity that the power of God I wish I had a Bible reading may rest upon me for when I am weak then am I strong but the only way he can occasion that statement is you got to go up a few verses he says, I had a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Have I got a witness here? Lest you get too high and your feet too far off the ground, God's got to send some stuff your way to humble you. Anybody here ever cried in the midnight hour? Anybody here ever did the best you could do and it still didn't work out the way you thought? Anybody here prayed and asked God for an answer and the answer didn't come but you're still hanging on? God will not always answer the way you think is appropriate. God will answer in a way that pleases him to make you a useful vessel. Now come on, help me testify right here. If it had not been for that divorce, you would not know how strong you really are by yourself. If it had not been for that spell of sickness, you would not know what your faith could bring you through in your midnight hour. 
you're still crying, but you got joy. Your heart is still hurting, but you still say hallelujah. You don't know where you went wrong, but you still give God the praise. Because you know that when praises go up, I wish I had some noise here. You know that when you trust and never doubt, he will surely... Not only does he use a, a shovel and a mallet, but then he has a wheel. And while he's at the wheel, there's a big wheel on the floor that when you visit the potter's house, you can hear it, but you can't see it. And you're looking at me right now. You don't know what I've been through. You can hear it. But you can't see it. That big wheel is down where you can't see. But there's a little wheel on the top. That's spinning that clay. You gonna help me preach this, won't you? Ezekiel saw a wheel. I wish I had one or two more Bible readers. It was a big wheel in the middle of a wheel. That's the Holy Ghost. Working in your life when folk can't see it. I'm messed up right now. But wait till he gets me off that wheel. I'm crying right now. But wait till I get off this wheel. I don't have a dime right now. But wait till he gets me off this wheel. I'm sick right now. But something going on that you can hear, but you can't see. I thank God that he's got a shovel. You're going to help me close this, won't you? I thank God he's got a mallet. I thank God he keeps me on the wheel. But while he's digging with that shovel, yes. while he's thumping with that mallet, yes. while he's spinning on that wheel, yes. I'm never out of his hands. Yes. It's not your hands. It's his hands. Because if it was your hands, you'd never stop hitting me. You see, that's why you can't let folk know where you're hurting. Because if you let folk know where you're hurting, they'll keep hitting in that same spot over and over and over and over. You can't let them know what gets on your nerves. No, no, not, 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 not that Baptist church person. You can't ever let them know that they have got you cross. No, no, just come in here. And if they got a Bible on the seat, just move it. And they'll tell you, that's somebody's seat. Just say, good morning. It might have been somebody's seat. But I ain't studying you. I come here to praise the Lord. And if you don't hush your mouth, I'm going to get you out your seat. I don't care nothing about no seat and about where you sit. Because seats is not about service. That's what's wrong with us. We are more concerned about seats than service. I thank God. That I'm not in your hands. Because you'd never stop beating on me. You'd never stop shoveling on me. You can't let folk know when you've messed up. Some sins you got to confess to the Lord. I wish I had a witness here. Everybody can't know your weak spots. Because they will use it to their advantage against you. 
Only God ought to know where the air bubbles are in your vessel. Because only God knows how to get those air bubbles out so that there'll be no weak spots in your testimony. You gonna help me close this, won't you? As long as that clay is on the wheel, it's in the potter's hand. But Jeremiah said this vessel got marred in the potter's hand. And then he started to make it all over again a brand new vessel. You gonna help me close this, won't you? I thank God when I got messed up on the potter's wheel, he didn't just throw me in the trash. He put me back in his hands and molded me and shaped me into an instrument fit for his use. You're going to help me preach this, won't you? Somebody else here this morning was marred in the potter's hand. You are all messed up physically. You are all messed up spiritually. You are all messed up psychologically. But then you allowed the potter to spin you on the wheel. Because if the potter doesn't hold his hands on the clay, it'll spin right off of the wheel. But the potter has to keep it there on the clay until it's ready to become a vessel fit for his use. And I'm glad this morning that I am a vessel fit for the master's use. Now my jar is cracked sometimes. <laughs> my jar is messed up sometimes. But that's why I come to church every Sunday. To get back on the potter's wheel. And let him shape me by his word. Because his word is a lamp unto my feet. And a light on my pathway. His word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against him. I thank God for his word because there's power in the word. There's deliverance in the word. There's salvation in the word. Is there anybody here know that the word can change your life? Listen to what the word says and see what it make you feel better. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even my enemies and my foes, came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Won't that make you feel better? Weeping may endure for a night, but joy will come in the morning. Won't that make you feel better? Has thou not known, has thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Father, the creator of the ends of the earth, there is no searching of his understanding. He giveth power to the faint. I wish I had somebody who read the word. And to them that have no might, he increaseth strength. The youth shall faint and grow weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not get weary. They shall walk and not faint. Won't that make you feel better? Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemaker, for they shall be called the children of God. Won't that make you feel better? There is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit won't that make you feel better eyes have not seen ears have not heard neither has it entered the hearts of men the good thing that God has in store for them that love him won't that make you feel better we are more than conquerors 